pleasure to speak today uh as my introduction has already been done i'll be very quick i am a technology law consultant and my work is largely in uh digital tech and law except blockchain and uh, ai and law is something which i have specialized in in terms of my work experience and everything and uh, yeah it's been a pleasure it's an honor to speak in this esteemed conference by the government law college mumbai so uh in this session since uh, this session is about ai and natural rights uh, it came into my mind to discuss about a very interesting proposal i had sent to the ministry of electronics and information technology government of india and this is the second version of it which we call as the draft artificial intelligence development and regulation act so uh, as i was deliberating with the conference organizers also i was pontificating on the question as to what should be discussed at the first place and it came into my mind that the best idea which could be discussed for anyone in the legal fraternity in the tech fraternity who attends this conference is ai standardization and through this session i will try to elaborate on that that's as to what does it mean so uh when we look at ai standardization the one thing which we really need to understand is that uh standardization means that you have to ensure certain standards for any technology any digital technology it could be ai it could be a health tech uh, product it could be in blockchain it could be it could not necessarily crypto it could be uh, in other domains also like genetic technology or uh, i don't know some other iot product right now uh, what's happened is that a lot of trends come in about open ai and uh, servum ai and many other companies about gen ai and gen ai became a topic across the world including india since 2022 when chat gpt 3.5 was launched but if you look at the history of ai and i'm not getting into turing and dartmouth the one interesting thing we have seen is that the the impact of ai in our human lives has already started from the 2010s like if you have a mastercard or a visa card or a namex card or a diners card then your transactions are going to be carried forward and understood by ai algorithms if you are for example in a banking infrastructure i'm pretty sure that in there's a pwc report in on financial services in india from hdfc to sbi all these banks have already integrated some level of ai in fraud detection and automating transactions for consumers not necessarily in payments but in like database management asset management and all those things so even in that aspect we have already seen that indian banks and even global banks like bank of america and all of those the chinese banks and singaporean banks of the world they have already implemented ai algorithms but they have not been implemented in those times in the 2010s at a very global scale it was like okay it is between banks it is between banks and customers it is between banks customers and government so it's a very close ended relationship so in a close ended relationship it becomes easy to regulate something or you know recognize that you know what this is the limited use of ai or for example amazon which is one of the biggest i would say e-commerce giants in the world like flipkart and others has factories all across the world right so uh, to have a sense of monitoring their workers while delivering products i'm, I'm not sure if it happens in india yet Uh, but in other countries like in america they already have uh, surveillance cameras in which they have used ai techniques simple predictive models to see if a worker is working or not what kind of products are they uh, shipping how are they doing it and all of that is being done now obvi- obviously it's a violation of privacy in workspace workplace and then again in american laws under the you know under under the first amendment and even under under, under other laws like uh, certain laws on communication and telecom it could be challenged there are issues and instances discussed in the us senate as well but 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 the idea is that you know the implementation of ai has already started now in the consumer background i think the only example we come to know where ai has been implemented is social media your x linkedin instagram to an extent even whatsapp if necessary if necessary although i don't think it's a messaging app it's an end to end encryption based service so social media is the most mainstream example of using algorithms because i'll tell you how it should used to work for example if you have reach of like 1 lakh followers in india 
and some b person or c person has reach of 10000 people in india then if you have the reach which is like any numbers 1 lakh 2 lakh 1 crore 10 10100 then based on that number of reach number of likes and all which is like in a horizontal territory which also you can call merit based you know what i've worked hard on social media i've got this many followers i've got got this many people this is the reach i have now that's how the algorithm used to work to analyze patterns of users to give you an outcome is to whether you uh, you should be given reach or not now since 2020 after covid struck the world unfortunately thank god we are not in the covid crisis ever again i hope we are not instagram x all these companies even tiktok which was banned in india fortunately because of much larger concerns than just trade issues it was more of a issue that tiktok could also hack your sim <laughs> uh, in india and in a country where we have already digital divide i think uh, a chinese company hacking our sim is not good in our own i would say individual interest and even national interest so uh, tiktok's banning was a justified move but what we can understand is that uh, algorithms have already become sophisticated in the consumer space now in the since the 2020 so before it was not that active facebook was already declining twitter was declining uh, instagram was declining in its reach only the bigger players were getting the share not every user was so what they did was if you have certain elements like music you have inter- inserted or screenshots or captions not keywords it will actually give you reach based on a vertical basis so same song or same content you will get the same reach the videos could be different the tags could be different now imagine the impact that it has so horizontal algorithms for 10 years now it's vertical which is recommendation algorithms and even china does it as tiktok and all these companies they have a very sophisticated algorithm so beyond social media also there are use cases but i thought i should you know elaborate on social media because it's something which is a very genuine aspect which is commonly known so uh, you know this explains you the relationship of ai and human environments so uh, let me just outline quickly as to what we will discuss what we will elaborate upon understand and explore in this session so there are these five to six questions which i've thought out in relation to this draft act which i proposed to mate and i hope that we get a response first is obviously what's the relationship between ai and human environments and it means very simple if there is an environment created by ai that you have to do certain things and get certain outputs then it's an ai environment if there's a human environment as to you know what i can speak telugu kannada or hindi or english or i can walk in this way or i am pictured in this way you will uh, you know uh, keep uh, uh, an input of me in this way then it is a human environment right that's how facial recognition cameras in digi yatra work which is a great solution um uh, to be very fair although yes there are certain pri- privacy concerns under article 21 which are legible to be raised even under the dpdpa uh which is fine so that is human environment that is ai environment so we'll actually discuss a little bit about the relationship because that explains in every sector from banking to fintech to fmcg to social media to uh, uh, drug discovery uh, and even others um, um recently a case came in i'm not sure if it's verified but i'll discuss a little bit of that but yeah so these are the some of the aspects which might for sure interest all of you uh beyond that yes uh, uh, we will be discussing about what are the marginal and nominal ways through which ai affects our economic rights because i'll be very honest on this i discuss and even work for tech professionals and executives wherever possible and the feedback that we also get is that uh, ai is kind of affecting our economic rights but not in a very dramatic way as depicted in science fiction like you know it's taking away everything like discussing in black mirror that's not how it's happening what's happening is that there are a set of human decisions and ai is not being used in an effective way i think that's where ai governance from a corporate or a private sector point of view that's where the problems are coming up and even sometimes from a government point of view so we'll discuss as to how does it affect our economic rights because it does does affect our human rights in terms of uh, privacy in terms of consent like i'll give you a simple example if i talk to chat gpt right now chat gpt 4 even the paid one because i use perplexity and it's a great tool because it has four large language models if i talk to chat gpt and within my 10 questions of asking in a particular order chat gpt can easily try to manipulate me to ask only certain questions which force me to reveal my personal data 
Now, if you have to get some work done through chat GPT, why should you release your personal information? It does not mean your Aadhaar number or something like that. It could be anything like some confidential information you have with your client or your family member or anyone. Why should you release that? So these large language models are currently not prepared to solve that problem. It's taking time. They have their own compliance measures and, you know, they have their own technological measures. These are big companies like OpenAI and others. But hallucination is a part of AI these days. And it's something which is a problem which is still being addressed, right? That's why we need to understand how it affects our human rights and economic rights. So I, we will discuss that. I'll discuss that. The next topic I'll be uh, approaching is how does the use of AI affect our knowledge management and intellectual property rights? And I'll get on the issue of patents and trademarks and even copyright uh, with an instance which we have referred to in the AI Act version 2. I hope that you would find it interesting. Uh, and the last two questions which I think everyone must be asking and I know it's a very important question is how can we regulate AI? Like should we sh shut it off? Like shut every AI in the world or should we have a specific approach to regulate to ensure that something has to be regulated and something does not have to be regulated. In that regard, there was an AI advisory which was published by the government of India. Some minor changes have happened on one point which is concerned pop-up mechanism. I'll discuss some minor bits of that to explain how regulation should be done and should not be done. And I think that's a great idea. But there are examples like the EU AI Act and China's four regulations on AI and even the executive order by US. And the last one I think is in the context of India as to how to prevent regulatory capture by adopting standardization. What techniques could be adopted? For that, uh, we have a set of definitions we have proposed on classifying AI. And I would be glad to discuss that with you. So uh, let's begin with the presentation and let's have it an interesting one. I'll be happy to take up questions and uh, as the time permits, as things permit. So, okay, let's address this quick question. What's the relationship between AI and human environments? It's a very poignant question to be very fair. And it is poignant because when we look at AI and human environments, they are based on their own understanding. Think of it in this way. If you are interacting with an animal, the animal wouldn't think like you. There will be certain similarities biologically, but it wouldn't think like you. A bird wouldn't think like you. A tiger is a cat, right? As a species, it wouldn't think like you. Therefore, even an AI system wouldn't think like you. And I think the best example is, I would say algorithms. So uh, somebody was asking this from a perspective of, you know, how social media affects your reach and how does it cause issues? Can it cause misinformation? Somebody was asking me, how does Twitter control your timeline and, you know, show your posts? Even on LinkedIn, it happens to an extent, even on other platforms. How does it show your reach? So it does in a very, I would say, funny way by creating an articulation method. You know what? You talked about something, then one keyword is taken from there. And then based on that keyword, something else happens. And then they put that post here and then some other random keyword is taken. Then another post related to that keyword is added. Now what happens is when these three posts are added by the AI, you are looking at a user thinking that, you know what? Oh, these three posts are related. Like I'll give you an example. And this is interesting from a consumer law point of view because, uh, uh, because companies are known to come up with such promotional campaigns, which actually could affect our consumer choices. For example, you're discussing about a very interesting Hollywood movie on some spy craft or something in the cold war. So that's a topic. Then another a tweet comes in, which is on uh, some business decision by an, by an ed tech company, uh, which is uh, focusing on UPSC coaching. Now you must be wondering that a ed tech post on UPSC coaching, how does it relate to a movie in cold war? I'll give you a simple hint In UPSC, you have to learn cold war if you're preparing for the IS exams, right? So the algorithm thinks, you know what? Okay, fine. This 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 organization is teaching or something posting on UPSC. Let's post it with the movie tweet on I don't know Cold War. So if something on Oppenheimer or something on Dunkirk comes in by Christopher Nolan, something on UPSC could also be there. Or there's a government scheme released by the government of India on uh, let us say women empowerment or jobs for women or skill uh, upliftment for women. Something down could also come about maybe a you know a media reporting about a bosco case or a posh case it happens right how the, how the legal media reports 
so even you know this these patterns happen and uh, this is one of the most interesting ways how twitter algorithm works we don't know much of the algorithm yet it's still being revealed so you know this explains that we are being told by ai systems as to how things are in an artificial sense in a defined sense while we as humans think in a much different way and this is why the relationship between ai and human environments matter now based on this based on this uh, there are also some interesting questions which come into my mind and uh, it's not just me even many people who have been practitioners in this field ask this questions so uh, we already know that ai systems are biased right i mean they are heavily biased that's true they make certain decisions the whole uh, consp- uh, the whole controversy with gemini was that gemini was posting uh the historically inaccurate things about world war and many other things which actually caused a pro that it's misinformation for american audience and even broader indian audience and other audiences right and uh, to be very fair google has a very sophisticated model but their employees as the media reported could not handle the tension out there and could not uh, give out uh, uh, i would say in outputs uh, could not lead the ai to give outputs which are objective enough so that's where an issue of misinformation comes in that you know a, a particular set of people in corporate governance in any big company or any startup are thinking this way that you know what the ai should give this kind of outcome not realizing that sometimes it might be too inaccurate or not helpful and they did not even give any disclaimer for example properly although google generally gives disclaimers they are a big company so this explains you how our perception affects for example there's a, a 18 year old person okay and the person knows nothing about history the person knows nothing about economics and the person thinks okay well, you know what let's go to chat gpt or gemini and ask them some questions and innocently the person types and you know even anyone we also in our general lives might not know about certain things right like how certain medicines work and we use google to find those things we use google for the even the most trivial things to find so if gemini is that power tool which will help us according to google i think their in- ai environment has to be a bit safe right they need to tell us what are we offering and why we can be accurate we can not be accurate we may be inaccurate we don't know right so i think um it is the responsibility of these companies to ensure and even startups to an extent recently ola krutram was launched i'll not comment on that much uh, people were arguing that the in- outputs which were coming from ola krutram which was a ai chatbot like chat gpt 3.5 uh, they were not accurate enough and that was a problem so fine i mean i think uh, uh, companies make errors and i think they should rectify that i think which is also a reason why the ai advisory came to many entities but obviously that is one of the concerns so obviously i'm not discussing ola krutram it's a very cryptic issue uh, a lot of things are verified not verified so gemini is verified because we know because we know google has apologized sundar pichai has apologized so we know so this is like one of the simplest examples or let me take a example to level 2 and then i'll move to the next topic uh, imagine you're going to a bank and you're not going to a bank physically you are going to a bank through an app okay and uh, through the banking app although banking apps are generally not that functional we know how they are uh, across banks maybe certain banks do it pretty well certain private sector banks certain certain don't but let us say they you know their app works fine on android and we go and uh, they have a chatbot now the bank is providing you an environment and you ask certain questions about your nft transaction or your it returns you need a balance sheet can you please email it to me i have to give it to somebody else blah 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 or it is something about your upi transaction because even your apps can help you to create a upi id right and instead of helping you an automating transaction <laughs> yeah uh, instead of automating your transaction the bank starts telling you the sorry the app starts telling you that you know their bank employees are not working well and uh, the work culture is not good and you must be wondering like okay fine how can a banking app behave like that now ironically that's exactly what happened in america when uh, a particular uh, financial co- i think it was a finance app and people were asking questions about certain transactions and things and the app was not properly fine tuned the ai generative ai by the way which actually gave you outputs which were not accurate enough and quite misleading against the company which is like 
i would say misleading and uh, showing your company in poor light which shows that yes ai tools are creating change but they are not perfect enough to affect the world i think agi is not even happening uh, even uh, the head of meta facebook instagram whatsapp mr the ai head by the way not even head the ai head mr yan lekyun who's a technology uh, expert himself and an ai scientist he says that um, agi cannot be achieved in 10 years and the reason is that uh, to achieve agi there are too many parameters of human intelligence which have to be captured like even to do a simple i would say action on chat gpt imagine the billion parameters and trillions of dollars invested in gpu and yet chat gpt makes efficient mistakes and is still not that much safe it can still be used for hacking so imagine investing that much money that much capacity you have in terms of technology the big tech companies in america have everything and yet they don't have effective outputs coming up because replacing human beings in a complete sense requires any ai to be i would say just like what we call as antaryami like you can just just have to do everything that you are not expected to do and that reminds me of the matrix in a very interesting movie called x-men days of future past if you really want to look about the sentinels very interesting movie uh like how the x-men uh, go in the past and you know f- ask the us president in the cold war not to build these robots because in f- f- 50 years in 2022 these robots are going to take over america and the whole world and you know all those sci-fi movies come like so this is how ai and human environments work in any sector that could be in any sector now let's discuss about a little as to the second question why does ai standardization matter that's kind of exactly where uh, uh, our forum comes in uh, this is not my consulting firm it's actually a forum we call as the indian society of artificial intelligence and law where we uh, have different committees through which we engage with smes and startups and even with relevant legal and prof- policy professionals who are kind of enthusiastic about ai and law and uh, we we do these meetings to understand their concerns i'll give you a simple example in november last year we hold a consultation with seven startups in india who were in who were in the legal tech space uh some of them were companies some of them were startups largely most of them were startups they were including uh, thompson reuters tipsy tom uh, webnyai and many more and we asked them as to what kind of technology have they created what kind of product they have and they came on the stage virtually and they discussed their concerns like you know what they have developed what is the limitation there's a very interesting company called hyperverge which has you know even developed your kyc solution using digi locker so if you're on linkedin and you need to do government id verification hyperverge and linkedin have a partnership and i'm not sure it might be it might not be anymore but for now i think it is uh, maybe few weeks ago something i am aware but i think maybe the partnership could not be but let's assume it is the hyperverge actually offers you the opportunity to you know uh, uh to get your aadhar or any other government id verified if it is on digi locker and linkedin does not get that data uh, hyperverge does the verification and then leave the uh, the 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 government id to you so that no privacy issues happen that's what they say again there could be concerns that is a different matter altogether so we ho- we held these uh, consultations and we came to know a lot about what's happening in the legal tech industry in india uh, how much people are trying what are the key real issues and that's why standardization matters and it's a very hard thing to start with because i'll tell you for media appeal and a lot of things even governments get panicked unfortunately across the world not just india even across the world this is a very common trend among bureaucrats uh if some local official in the department of defense could be worried instantly unless the department of defense official in the us doesn't even know what chat gpt is doing because the national security advisor in the us is connected to open ai they hold consultations in every week so they know what's happening that's why they are not scared anymore in india we don't have that advanced technology yet even under law firms i think the only law firm which i have heard which is doing pretty well is nishit desai associates which i congratulate them wholeheartedly it's a great inspir- they are a great inspiration for the legal fraternity but beyond nishit desai i don't think anyone uh, any law firm is doing that yet i think some are trying to do and uh, even in certain meetings i had in the past i think what came to know was that uh, building a legal tech solution 
which could be applied pan india is not about the cost i mean if the government comes and supports and some support comes from the judi- honorable judiciary i think cost is not the issue resources are not the issue the problem is that for every lawyer or legal professional the legal tech is going to be up for completely different purpose and then nobody would allow getting their proprietary content which is their legal documents inserted into the ai because copyright concerns right you have drafted a contract you have drafted a lease deed you have drafted anything why would you want your private document a formal law firm or a chamber be given to an ai system which could just hallucinate and make mistakes right the risk is huge that's why standardization matters and which is why we hold these consultations in april also we are trying to hold a, a set of consultations with fintech players in india maybe not the bigger players but maybe smes and startups who are trying to introduce ai into their fintech products and it could be payment gateways it could be anything uh, we are still in talks with some of them and if things go right i think we will be holding consultations with them in april so uh, that's why you know i thought i should reflect a little about why ai standardization matters so this is what it is uh, this is how it works it works in a very simple way and i'll discuss that a little bit now in detail so uh, to begin with then to understand why uh standardization matters this is a specific draft from the ai act.10 version 2 which we had the opportunity to propose to the ministry of it now uh to standardize ai before even understanding why regulation matters it's better to categorize that first because if you do not know what are you categorizing you don't know what are you standardizing then you even don't know what are you going to regulate and if you come up with a random regulation which kills the industry then nobody would be able to afford it because the potential that ai has for india is just huge i'll give you a simple example uh now we know that uh the farming community our farmers our annadatas they represent a huge part of the indian economy right even in terms of demography now we know that due to the kind of weather patterns and all they are suffering because their crops you know get affected and you know they don't have effective resources and many things happen at a state level across the world across the country not just one state like across the world across the country so uh, ai companies already exist in india which actually can use drone cameras using ai and then go through all the crop fields the vegetation and then analyze the crop health and you know tell the farmer that you know what there is some uh, lack of fertilizer or something like that now that could be a revolutionary technology because every farmer can't afford a satellite right you can't afford to get a satellite from uh, you know not a satellite use rights using satellites from isro you can't get that all the time you don't have that money which is fine but again that economy can be only encouraged when the government comes into play and comes up with the government scheme which helps these farmers to you know get the crop health and even understand weather patterns and many other things so again this is one use case of ai which needs to be standardized and categorized from an economic point of view which is why we came up with this uh, stratification and it's very simple by the way so there are four ways to do it the first way is uh, a conceptual way like you define the conceptual purpose of an ai technology because every ai system has an inherent purpose companies come up with their own agendas and motives and we, they make it very clear on their websites and statements and uh, speeches that you know what we want to develop this ai for this purpose right uh, recently elon musk had the chance to file a case against open ai for on this very simple point that open ai said that we are an open source company and say to do things for free turns out that obviously the objectives change which is like fine but then again as a former investor or something like that elon musk has his concerns and he is within his rights to file a case against open ai and others right so from a conceptual point of view it's important to know why this ai matters because too much money is involved right 100 million dollars or more than that and even a lot of money is involved it's better to have a clear conceptual slate about it which is why we thought that you know what why not we categorize ai system space on this as well or ai ventures ai products so the first one obviously is a conceptual mode of classification and this starts with the idea of issue to issue like there are specific subject matter specific specific issues based on which you can classify then it could be a little about the ethics based relationship like i discussed in the first point right 
about AI environment and human environment and how AI environment affects human environment, how human inputs from human environment affect AI that become bi- that you know that may be the reason why biased outputs come in. So that is ethics based classification. Then another could be phenomena based, which is like some incident or accident has happened, and because of which the AI uh, system is not able to work properly. For example, uh, although I hope nobody, uh, I know student is here who's participating in a moot court. I had the chance to draft a moot problem for a COVID law school, which in which I discussed this issue that what if an AI system which is good for fraud detection in banks fails, and then what are the emergency measures that a government should take legally? right so phenomena based classification and then the last one is a little technical like anthropomorphism based which is like an ai starts behaving in a certain way like a human due to certain human tendencies but it doesn't mean that the ai can understand because no ai system these days can understand what they do nor they can even explain what they do in fact this is a very important technical question addressed by everyone from meta to XAI to OpenAI, everyone is concerned. Like an AI can give very interesting outputs, but an AI can't understand something. And if they can't understand something, can that issue be addressed at heart? I think that is something which is to be classified to an extent to see how much it affects. That's why anthropomorphism based classification. Then there are certain other ways and I'll be very quick on that. This is quite simple, a very obvious way, which is like technical methods. For example, OpenAI's ChatGPT and Gemini, all of these come under the general intelligence applications, which is like they can do too many things. For example, you're filing a visa application or, uh, and, and by the way, I have written an article on this as well. Uh, I actually asked ChatGPT to draft an arbitration application for the Allahabad High Court. <laughs> and I gave them some model issues, you know, uh, invoke uh, these sections uh, and these uh, rules of CPC randomly. And ChatGPT did come up with a template, but the problem is the template was not that accurate because they just copied it from the Allahabad High Court illegal X website because they had data until 2021. They just copied it. They don't care about copyright. So uh, they did that, right? So ChatGPT can help you creating a recipe book, uh, give you a summary itinerary for your visa application, create a legal contract template for you, even if not accurate, can do multiple things for you can do translation for you, like Hindi translation, Maratha translation, anything it, you want, right? So all of that it can do. So multiple use cases. Uh, uh, then then there's another category. So for example, there's a chatbot which came in, I'll not name the company of them. Uh, $100 million were invested in that AI. And within six to 12 months, their relevance was gone because the kind of outputs they were coming in, they were not helping any user. They were just some repetitive outputs and they were not uh, industrially viable. It's like uh, you're manufacturing a smartphone, but turns out that the hardware and the software you were involved in making the smartphone, whether assembled in India or anywhere, like an iPhone, for example, the product is not, uh, does not have any quality anymore. So if within six months, if it turns out that uh, any iPhone which is coming to India or made in India, assembled in India, does not have any quality, why will you buy that iPhone? Or even an Android phone, right? The same applies to AI. That if within six to 12 months, uh, your outputs are not good for a consumer market, then your use case does not survive, which is why we have the second classification. The third one is a very uh, uh, general one, very easy one, which is like uh, banking chatbots or uh, something like Digiatra or something like uh, uh, something like the Election Commission of India has a website where an AI chatbot can answer your queries if you put your relevant uh, government ID, which is offered by the Election Commission. They did it for voter sensitization to help voters so that they can get their vote, you know, get themselves get themselves registered in voter rolls. And they do it every in every elections from Vidhan Sabha to Lok Sabha to even by elections they do it. So these are like one or two use case based applications. Another way is commercial, which is like commonly known to everyone, like AI as a product, AI as a service, AI as a component in something, which we need to know. AI as a system, which is very important because uh, uh, government of India is already thinking about including AI uh, using Bhashini and other motives. Like Bhashini is a great initiative with the Digital India Corporation. And I like it because Bhashini 
is such a great tool you don't need google translate if you are somewhere across the country who can do translations for the government and this is just like a volunteering thing like somebody can translate a telugu text into hindi or a hindi text into telugu or english text into kannada or something like that the ai system will actually capture that and provide it to all the citizens all across the country so that's a great way to break the language barriers that we have right people get confused about it and you know that's a great way to do the so bhashini by uh, digital india corporation is a great initiative so it might come into ai as a component or ai as a system or ai as an infrastructure which is a thing also being discussed in the us very seriously about integrated ai embedded ai and the last one i think which is also a very important one and i'll be quick on that is risk centric method of classification which is like you classify ai based on their outcomes now uh, we have not classified on the basis of intent because again intent could be a lot of things but you know developers are responsible to ensure certain background checks because they know that there might be some outcome that's a much better way to regulate and cause you know any sense of action against them if needed maybe criminal maybe civil based on how it is like a fintech app could be misleading people to get a lot of credit loans while their civil score is not good enough and civil scores are not uh, are not managed by fintech apps they are managed by third party companies and uh, somehow i mean the rbi has been very efficient in this but i'm just imagining like in us it happens a lot right so uh, could there be narrow risk systems or high risk systems and we have also done in a way to ensure that any startup which actually wants to develop an ai product or service doesn't get affected by regulation and doesn't get uh, affected by the need to innovate because many people might not be able to afford i can tell you that the minimum the minimum you need to invest in ai technology with gpus is around 20 to 30 lakhs or more right so the cost is huge to start with for anyone who's incubating a startup for ai so in summary uh, uh, this is how we can try to standardize uh, this is one of the ways and definitely there are more ways to do now let's address another question uh, okay i think my screen is uh, not visible uh, let me share it again yeah yeah i think uh, it could be visible now yeah yeah so uh, the next question we should address is okay fine we know how to standardize ai that's a possibility it's a great thing to go forward what are the marginal and nominal ways to do it like what's the most basic way to do it now let me give you the example of a fridge you bought a great fridge like a multi story fridge and uh, you have a remote uh, which is embedded you through bluetooth on your phone and uh, 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 the door closes and opens based on you know you are in kitchen you're not using it efficiently and uh, uh the ai fridge might be the ai in the fridge might be thinking you know what let me just have our, my own systems in check whether cooling systems whether closing the door opening the door whether anything and i do it for the interest of the con- consumer and the consumer doesn't have to do anything for example you know there's a nozzle you have to go through in the freezer part where you have to see if it is suitable for winter or summer or monsoon now you don't have to do that the ai will do it for you but what happens is one day you need something pretty much urgent from the fridge right a, a bottle of water or anything or by mistake you put your phone in the fridge happens right lives are tough and uh, you try to open the fridge and it doesn't open then what will you do your phone is stuck your daily life is affected right and i, I know it's a very trivial example but that's exactly how ai problems happen or let's say your car it's not even autonomous driven it has a software which kind of affair, you know uh, te- uh, checks your uh, doors and for security reasons it automatically closes the doors and even your keys can't open it your manual keys then how then how will you manage it the ai software thinks that okay fine i've closed it and uh, and and somehow you le- you leave your phone in the car people do it right and you can't open it there's no control there's no manual override how will you handle that problem so i think on these aspects there are marginal ways which affects our you know autonomy and our basic uh, i would say rights to do but as i discussed in the beginning about economic rights 
I'll tell you how uh, in nominal ways AI affects our economic rights. And I think the best example for that to start with is social media. But even beyond that is a little bit about marketing dynamics. For example, any product or service comes in or you you are trying to understand what should you purchase and what should you not have then the search engines which are responsible which you which do the seo optimization they are using ai they have been using it for 10 years or more and when they're using it they actually could affect your economic rights because at the end of the day they could make your consumer choices for example uh, you are on facebook and you didn't even come to know that some shampoo brand is trying to search you through google and amazon only to ask you to buy something on amazon that's a consumer law practice problem which is already being addressed in the recent consumer law rules i think uh, they are related to invasive patterns and the advise advertising council uh, of india has also expressed their interest in this which is great from an advertising point of view and it could affect your economic rights right another way that it affects your economic rights is for example you work hard and you build an app you put it on app store or sorry play store on google and uh, google gets crazy and it just deplatforms your app you worked hard on it you earned money you paid all the commission google wanted you to which is too much for an indian company like shaadi.com and all those had this issue right kuku fm all of them raised the concern to the government and the concerns are legible because Uh, 90% of and users in india are android based very few people use uh, ios or mac or ipad they don't so obviously google has a dominance which is why if, as uh, you know phone pay came up with uh, indus app store which is again india ka app store as they say which is great i have also installed it it's, it works well uh, it's more transparent than google like it tells you what's the what's the uh, data you you, you will uh, take you will have to use to download your app and what is the operational data that will cost will be cost if you are using the app that is something which google play store never used to tell although data is cheap and free in these days in india which is great but you must know right how your how much data, how much download data and upload data your app takes so that's a great measure by indus app store and let us see how they succeed and how they go through but i mean indus app store still needs to be successful but what it shows is that google or twitter or facebook can affect your economic choices and uh, there's a lack of government capacity and lack of case laws also in addressing these issues because i am pretty sure that a consumer forum in any city would not be that much capable to handle it uh, with due respect to all members of the consumer forum anywhere so i think because very few cases against zomato or by jews get through on consumer law this is as per evident information so it's in for important that even our forums understand this and I, i'm pretty sure that uh, uh, there are measures to address those problems as well that's why i thought you know it would be interesting to discuss this as well uh now let's discuss something else too so uh a quick part on ip rights and i'll make it much simple for everyone because i know that you know discussions happen on copyright and patents and everything but what does it mean what does it mean in translation so let us say you are a great artist okay and uh, you built some painting on anime or carnatic style or some i don't know maratha history or mogal history whatever you want to <laughs> whatever you create okay whatever artistic style you have and uh, you create it using adobe or you paint it and then you know have it scanned as a pdf and then put it on reddit and otherwise for sale you think that you know what this painting will come on instagram people will like it they'll come to you they'll purchase the painting you do your promotion as an artist and turns out that uh, mid journey or dali which are big tech led uh, visual ai models they uh, kind of scrape your data which is your painting or your photo and then they create a similar copy of it which is not that good as you have made but turns out that you know what 
it's as good as you have made and then what happens is and this is a real issue that happened on reddit which is another social media is that when that painting was there it was an anime painting made by a japanese or made by an american uh reddit started saying that uh, you have a copyright claim on that artist because this is made by mid journey which is an ai tool and the artist is like i have cre- painted this myself i've sketched it myself i have posted it there's a time stamp for it how is it not mine now see you made a painting it's yours you know it is yours you have evidence but a social media company can uh, affect your copyright and it also affect your economic rights and uh, obviously the matter in china something like that happened and uh, the person won the case against uh, if i'm right tencent which is like a part of alibaba and all that sorry it's one of the companies not alibaba but yeah they are related related companies under the chinese government for sure so yeah uh, so 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 interestingly even these issues happened right but then again the question is for example uh, open ai and mid journey if they make these mistakes they have billions of dollars too you know so they can pay you 5 million dollars as compensation easily they have no issues with it you just need a enforcement action a court may come up with an order the government of india complies you can get it uh, the delhi high court is actually great at this on ip issues i think one of the best high courts when it comes to ip and i really respect the bench for their i would say genuine work on this uh, and let us say the delhi high court comes up with okay so uh, open ai can pay you 5 million dollars but can a startup which has just raised some 10 million dollars from vcs would be able to pay you the same unfortunately they wouldn't be so the standard of compensation is also not known which is a huge issue for artists even writers uh, for anything which is uh, text based it's already a lost territory because uh, the new york times has already filed a case against open ai saying that whatever we write you just scrape the data even if it is within paywall so if somebody who is getting uh, access to paid content for free or through you i'm sorry why should we not be compensated for it and how are you just doing it without any uh, sense of ethics right that's that's the question which new york times has raised in the lawsuit so i think these are pertinent issues and they are interesting issues as to uh, how company decisions affect ai outputs then how are they connected to copyright violations or patent violations i think that's the interplay we need to properly deal with uh, and just an interesting scoop to add uh, on patents a very interesting update came in the uk high court which said that you can actually patent uh, uh, ai if you can prove the process of a uh, process that makes the ai work and if you can patent the process itself you can get a patent application approved patent certificate basically you you can get it patented by the uk patent office so that's an interesting thing but then again the problem is if you get it done then the bigger companies will be more beneficiary because for them it will be easy i'll give you the simplest example imagine the kind of patent applications apple sends to us patent offices and they are just some of the most insane i would say to pardon my french some of the most insane patent applications on every component of their iphone every component of their airport they're starting it from they have they have been doing since i don't know since 2010 and they have filed patent for versions of iphone way way before they are even launched and apple is within it their rights to do so they have a very good research and development lab okay they are great at r&d and hardware but the point is you see how patent wars happen it affects innovation right very few companies would be able to outcompete apple i think teenage engineering is one of them which is trying and there are certain others but the patent wars are huge so if uh, the ai patentability thing happens at a wide scale then uh, microsoft can easily say that no ai startup can come up with this product or something because it is kind of based on ours so we have a royalty model you have to pay this much uh, uh, money which is not sustainable for you so it could affect ai innovation 
I think uh, this is also an important question in the case of intellectual property to consider. So let's address the final question of the day. And I think there's one more and I think then I will take some questions. How can we regulate AI? Now, uh, as I said, standardization is the way. Uh, you just need to start recognizing that there are certain fault lines and there are certain limitations. Every company can't do the same way. Every system doesn't work the same way. Uh, our method, which we proposed in the AI Act dot in version two draft, is just one of the ways. And we uh, this is not a government of India draft. This is a private effort from our end for a sense of awareness also because we thought AI is becoming an important ecosystem in India and industry. Why should we not have a sense of consumer awareness? and intellectual awareness about AI, right? Uh, because if we have a draft bill in public, we can discuss the merits and demerits and that helps us to have an informed discourse and that helps everyone, good for all. Uh, that enables a democratic discourse as we say it. So uh, uh, yeah, you can regulate AI, start with standardization, categorize, categorize it effectively. Uh, do not come up with compliance at the beginning. Start with keeping a record of it. There's a very interesting paper uh, published by the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, in which uh, a paper authored by Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal says, very interesting paper, that you need a national registry of AI where you have to document all these products and services of AI, which is like use cases. It's like uh, a registry where you discuss about the features and the limitations of AI products or systems, and then you keep it open to uh, Come, uh, stakeholders like you can do it in India stack using DigiLocker or others, right? And if that happens for the AI ecosystem, for the tech ecosystem, a lot of great inputs can be come back. And then within five years, you can keep anticipating the risk. You already have provisions in the IT Act. You already have provisions in, I mean, uh, the, 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 the criminal, the new criminal laws have been implemented. Uh, you already have the provisions in the criminal laws. You have enough jurisprudence. The interpretation and in courts will go the same way. Uh, you have the cyber security cells and police stations across the country. You have the infrastructure. You just need to do it effectively for enforcement action. If that's the fear that AI could affect and that's fine. But direct regulation might not help because the cost would be too, too, too huge and nobody would be able to invest uh, or work on AI at all. So I think that's the much safer way to start with. The cyber cells are very effective in that across police stations in India. I think they can try to do it. Some of them are really good. Uh, so yeah, regulation is possible. Just start with standardization. I think that's my proposition. I might be wrong. I might be right. I don't know. But I think as per my discussion and understanding and working with professionals in tech, that's what we come to know. So uh, before I take the question, this is one point which I need to address. And I think I might have time for five to 10 minutes to take, to take the questions. Like how can we prevent regulatory capture of AI by adopting standardization? And as I said from the beginning, the best way is you document, you don't take hasty actions, you take enforcement when you need. For example, I'll discuss the AI advisory a little bit and um, the AI advisory which was uh, you know published and uh, not published publicly, it was sent to various companies on March the 1st. Now what happened is that a section of the media when reported it, they said that all platforms are going to be affected. And it was true, even in the advisory doc, when even I found it uh, uh, through my colleagues and others, it actually came to know that, yeah, all platforms are going to be affected. But the problem is, will a computer science student or a startup person across the country would have to take their 200 page code to New Delhi, to Lodi Road, to get this approved in the Meti office all the time. Or there's a, there a digital way to do it. Unfortunately, there are no answers for those questions. It turns out that uh, the government of India came up with a clarification through the Minister of State of IT. I'm, I feel sorry for the clarification. I think they said it that, no, 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 no. Everyone does not have to do it. It's only the big tech companies, which is significant companies. You should have said it before. So it creates a sense of panic and uh, people fear that they come, you know, even NRIs who are investing in AI, they come from US, they come from Europe, they come from Singapore, they hope that the Indian ecosystem will help them. There's a great population out there. There's a great use case out there. And it turns out that the advisory doesn't make sense, right? 
although the concerns are important on deep fakes and it's not that hard to do all you need is uh, you need third party companies who can actually uh, do a rigorous i would say labeling of content as ai content or human content which is you can do already in the music side sound you can already do it in videos you can already do it in photos and graphics uh, but when it comes to text based content i don't think it's possible because i'll give you a simple example uh, every text output that comes using chat gpt and others it is based on coding so there is a mathematical pattern but what if i tell you and unfortunately this happens in universities not necessarily in law but it happens in universities across the world what if you copy your content which is in english translated to roman or italian then retranslated to english and then you paste it as a part of your project the plagiarism rate would be zero because the content is translated so many times then you won't even be able to know if it is copied or not <laughs> so you translate from english to italian to kannada to maratha to whatever to <laughs> english <laughs> so so grammar changes and everything changes so uh, these are also certain manipulative so in text is already a lost game but in video and others i think the 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 battle is not lost legally and technically but in text i think if you have domain domain expertise you understand english grammar or any grammar i think you can counter this pretty well so uh, this was it on standardization and i hope this discussions has been insightful and helpful to all uh, and yeah uh, thank you sir for the, this insightful session just we have two papers respect to that session then we'll take the q and a will work sir sure i'll be fine with that I think I'll be